Welcome to the HX webinar series, Deal or No Deal, 104 Ways to Succeed in an Era of Crowdfunding. My name is Scott Jordan. I'm the founder of Health Eos Exchange. And joining me today is Chris Flayhaus, Manager of Global External R&D at Eli Lilly. Health Eos Exchange is the premier investment marketplace dedicated exclusively to the global healthcare industry, employing crowdfunding as the cornerstone of a new funding paradigm. Healthy Health Exchange offers direct access to the broadest opportunities on a fee-free, carry-free basis in the most trusted online environment. You'll be placed in listening mode. If you have questions, please submit them by entering them into the chat box. Chris and I will be answering these questions throughout the presentation, including a brief Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Uh, we are also recording the presentation, and we'll send it to your attention uh, following the conclusion. So the agenda for today's uh, webinar with Chris is basically uh, we're going we're to have five subjects and then we're going to have a Q&A. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is you know what is crowdfunding and why now? What is Health Eos Exchange? We're going to talk about HX scoring. That's the 104 ways to succeed, by the way, for the emerging growth companies in the audience. Um, uh, Chris is going to talk about you know what's important what, uh, to Eli Lilly when it comes to search and evaluation. And then there will be some contact information if you'd like to get a hold of, a hold of myself and list in the Healthy Health Exchange, become a member, and, then, and, and also contact in information for Chris. So what is crowdfunding and why now? So crowdfunding, the definition basically, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I think you know, everybody realizes that, you know, what it is with Kickstarter and Indiegogo and the rewards-based side. But, it really is raising small amounts of capital from a large group of investors. This is a direct investment model, which is which could be uh, disruptive to a certain extent to the existing capital sources from the standpoint that there's no two and twenty, there's no retainer, and typical uh, crowdfunding portals are charging a success fee on the amount of money raised by the portal. It's being fueled by advances in social media and technology. Obviously, the success of LinkedIn, Facebook, etc. Uh, metadata is uh, the XML um, platform. It, it allows you to do things like Match.com, which, in a, in, a, in a sense, is basically increasing the efficiency of raising capital and, and, and getting exits or partnerships. So, with with matching of data, right? It's basically what we're trying to do is is to make capital uh, capital information data flows more efficient by matching investment professionals and strategic buyers like Eli Lilly. So, for example, if you had um, if you had an oncology company and Lily was looking for oncology companies, then we would try to link the two parties together. The types of crowdfunding that we see out there today, predominantly, you've got there's more than this, but these are the, your big ones: donation rewards-based crowdfunding, Kickstarter, Indiegogo. I think last time I checked, they've you know on an annualized basis they've raised 500 million dollars, and that's really prepaying for a product like the Pebble Watch, but that's been very very successful. Debt crowdfunding peer-to-peer, -peer, $2 billion in origination so far uh, or on an annualized basis for peer-to-peer -peer lenders. Uh, lending Club, and I should say Lending Club, Lend Lending Club and Prosper are your two big, competi are your, your, your two big uh, companies in that space. And the advantage, obviously, of that crowdfunding is, is you, know, you, you get a return, you get a return of capital. Uh, equity crowdfunding, like Health Yields Exchange and one of our competitors, Polywog, out on the East Coast in the healthcare space, basically there's three three areas of uh, return here. You, you know, you can get a carry. There's carry models, um, dividend, and a share of profits, uh, more so in the real estate industry. Why crowdfund now? Major economic challenges. Um, this is no surprise, even though you know, the number of VCs over the last 10 years has been cut in half. And uh, the annualized uh, aggregate amount of capital that's, uh, that's uh, you know, devoted to the industry has gone down by about 17% versus 10 years ago. So it's, uh, it's getting better, obviously, because of the IPO market and the liquidity. So it is cyclical. It's not the death of VCs by any, by any nature. But if you're outside San Francisco and the Boston area, you're obviously going to be uh, very challenged trying to raise venture capital money. So we call that value void or innovation gap is what we call it. So you can see some of the definitions of that. But it's really what it comes down to is early stage companies having difficulties raising capital. Um, so, what are the opportunities? Well, it's a big industry, and I'll show you some numbers here in a second. The regulatory changes, the Jobs Act, really changed the dynamics of raising money directly from accredited investors currently, and then non-accredited investors when Title III of the Jobs Act is passed. 
Um, only 5% of the accredited investors have a private placement in their portfolio, which is pretty shocking if you think about it because, um, you, know, you know, there's a lot of money that's gone into public non-trader REITs. There's a, in the alternative investment bucket, there's a lot that goes into oil and gas. A very uh, small amount of accredited investors have investments in private companies. Investor appetite for healthcare investment rivals only technology. I'll show you some data on that as well. Capital investment and employment suffering. I mean, uh, this is uh, this has changed somewhat in the last year or so, but there's still a major gap between the seed startup up in your left northwest corner there, seed, seed and startup in the equity side. Um, you know, loans. That's why peer-to-peer -peer lending is is really taken off because the banks have been really tight-fisted after the Great Recession, and the IPO market obviously has has uh, definitely uh, had a great year. So uh, we'll probably modify that that box there. The Jobs Act. So I'll, I'll you know here's what is it six different you know uh, parts of the Jobs Act, and I'll go through the ones I think that have the biggest impact on companies raising capital or accredited investors seeking uh, seeking investments. By the way, you, you know other than you know this 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 uh, webinar is about scoring and it's about search and evaluation. And Eli Chris at Eli Lilly is going to talk a lot about what's important to Lilly when it comes to search and evaluation. Um, but I, I will say that uh, what's interesting from a strategic perspective is the, the one of the things that we can do with raising money from accredited investors and to, and to fill this innovation gap is to provide more companies to Lilly that have reached milestones. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the, uh, the capital continuum. The highlights here for the Jobs Act, um, Emerging growth company IPOs making it easier to go public. List the general solicitation ban, which just happened a few weeks ago. Uh, there's some more bells and whistles associated with um, generally soliciting to accredited investors. By the way, it's accredited investors only. It has nothing to do with not accredited investors. You have raises the shareholder cap. This is a big one, 500 to 2,000, because in the past you had to go public when you hit 500 investors, and so you couldn't raise a small amount of money from a large group of people because you'd end up having to go public. So that's a, that's, a, that's a really important one. Increase the limits on Reg A. Uh, legalizes crowdfunding, uh, non-accredited investment. This has yet to be approved by the SEC and FINRA. Uh, and then funding platforms um, simplifies the posting and investing. So the JOBS Act ha has had a major role here in why Healthios is sponsored. Healthios Exchange, by the way. Um, the crowdfunding targets. So who's in the crosshairs to a certain extent? It also can be it can also augment some of these groups. But if you take a look at no fee, no carry, what that means obviously is, is that there's no retainer, there's no two in the twenty, and there's no carry. So that's it's it's like anything with technology with iTunes or any of the other disruptive technologies, it's usually slicing costs out of the system. So let's take a look at the size of the markets and let's take a look at the cost parameters. You know, Reg D's, you know, this is a trillion dollar industry, largely dominated by public non-trader REITs and oil and gas investments and commodities in the alternative investment bucket. Typically, people invest in these assets through broker-dealers. Those broker-dealers can take upfront fees of anywhere between 5 to 15 percent, which is, um, on the high end, it's very egregious. On the angel investing side, it's, still, it's a big market, $22.5 billion, but they have annual dues. So that some high net worth investors don't like that too much. They also sometimes don't like to uh, uh, participate in the meetings. Uh, they just maybe they just want to invest directly in a company. Venture capital, $30 billion invest on an annualized basis, and they have two and 20. And the Kaufman study came out and said that the two and 20 is not working very well. Works really well for the top decile of performing venture capitalists. But on average, the average VC does not outperform an ETF. So um, after fees. So crowdfunding is trying to get a slice of those three top. The the three on the bottom you know, are a little bit uh, more straightforward, and the fees, friends and family, for example. Uh, credit investors, private placements. So eight million accredited investors in the U.S., 41 percent of whom have invested in VC funds, and only five percent have invested directly in Reg D offerings. And healthcare ranks among the top priorities. So what's interesting is that even though healthcare ranks as a top priority, uh, very few people have investments in to uh, you know private placements. And uh, so that's 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 the opportunity that we have in front of us. 
what is Healthy OS Exchange? I'm just going to go through a few slides here so you can see some of the some of the functionality, and then we're we're going to have Chris uh, take up from the uh, search and evaluation side. So, so the healthcare investment marketplace. You'll see that this is a very very uh, robust platform. Okay, so uh, we have four portals: Crowd Finance, Foundation Place, Express, and In Market. Crowd finance is basically for not raising capital from accredited investors from non-venture backed companies. Foundation Place is, is basically partnering with mission-based organizations for social good. So that would be your venture philanthropy, similar to uh, Calatico with Cystic Fibrosis Vertex. Express stands for Exclusive Preferred Emerging Growth Sponsored Security. That is for raising capital from accredited investors for venture backed companies. And then in market is for our liquidity portal, for helping with ATM, direct listings, and pipes. So we don't feel, by the way, as a FINRA registered broker dealer that, that um, crowdfunding alone will be enough, raise enough money to get the average pharma medical device company to approval. On average, a successful biotech company raises $49 million over 5.7 years. So our competition has raised, just to set expectation, our, comp our, our competition has raised uh, circle up in the consumer goods side and uh, funders club on the tech side and of course angel list circle up I think their maximum deal so far has been three million so it's in the early stage of the ball game we have a long ways to go but we're very excited uh, you know excited about that so very robust uh, three key pillars here uh, open access everyone's welcome it's like angel list we don't adverse select we don't you know just put a few companies on there well everybody is welcome Number two, HX scoring, which is what this this uh, this this webinar is about, is essentially assisting our constituents, our credit investors, VCs, strategics, and other capital sources like foundations and family offices, uh, with their search and evaluation efforts. Fee free, carry free means we don't get a fee, we don't get a retainer, and we don't take carry. We get uh, anywhere between five to ten percent success fee on capital that's raised in the system. It is a continuum of capital. Uh, we think all are necessary from non-venture backed all the way through our liquidity portal. We don't do IPOs or secondaries via the portal. We have uh, no adverse selection means right now we have 5,000 emerging growth companies in the platform. We, um, a, a certain percentage of those are curated, meaning that think LinkedIn company pages. We actually pre-populated the company pages and are encouraging the companies to come in and fill out their profile like you see on Crunchbase or TechCrunch. So uh, I'll have those numbers for you. But we're, uh, we launched August 2nd, and we have 1,000 members thus far, which is very exciting. Those members comprise investment professionals, um, strategic buyers like Lilly, accredited investors, and emerging growth companies. Each company gets their own page. It's actually 46 market sectors now. It's organized by ecosystem, so you can become a follower of any company and receive catalyst updates. When anything changes in the score, which we'll go into in a second, there's 104 measures, uh, or if they add a document or a team member or an investor. We don't have 100,000 yet, but we will shortly. Uh, we have a very unique way of ra or, uh, getting uh, wealthy people to the site. Uh, what we're saying here is, is that no orphans, meaning that we have many different capital sources in this continuum that are participating, including VC firms, family offices, foundations, alternative funds, etc. Uh, and there's a fully integrated social engine, meaning that we drive these investors to your page. If you remember, we talked about Match.com. Um, you know, if you put oncology or cardiovascular devices in your profile, we'll match that with companies that have that as a development program. On the, on the research side, uh, we have our research, by the way, is, is mostly all quantitative. Uh, it's not your buy, sell, hold that you typically see from some of the other banks. It's basically the scoring is one component of the research. We also have capital flows by market sector. If you're an investor wondering whether I should put my money into ophthalmology or should I put it in orthopedic devices. So we have also third-party research on the portal, and it's relevant to all the ecosystem. Here's your one company, one page. So think LinkedIn company page. Let's take it from the northeast. We'll swing around. The HX score, that's what we're going to talk about in a few minutes. This is, by the way, for Formula Pharmaceuticals. It's raising a phase 2A 
for a um, uh, it's an immunotherapy for refractory AML and they have there's a fundraising targets by the way this is for demonstration purposes only you have target raise days left you have an invest now button which is the e-platforms where the investors actually go in and make investments look at the subscription documents electro electronically sign money goes into escrow when the minimum is raised by the way that minimum should be say five hundred thousand out of zero and then essentially what happens is that money is released to the company and we get five percent that's the way it works there's a minimum maximum raise, there's a pre-money valuation, there's the use of proceeds. If we swing around, you'll see the description of the company and then the tabs of company highlights, Q&A, public documents, video, and um, some private stuff as well. So each company has a distinct branding, uh, which is very interesting. And the followers here down in the, in the lower corner here will get catalyst updates. So if you followed Formula Pharmaceuticals, if anything changed in their score, which is 104 measures, then you would get an update. You get a catalyst update. So it's got like Google alerts on steroids. It really is an exciting part of this. Uh, if there's a Q&A session, uh, you, can, you can talk with management directly. Um, and we can also do offline one-on-one -on -one meetings and webinars. So this uh, no adverse selection, once again, these 5,000 emerging companies, you've got um, offline meets online. So you have a situation where we have 14 uh, offline meetings think and this is of, of strong interest and Chris will most likely talk about this a little bit during his talk since he's attended one of these uh, partnering forums but think about like the bio partnering forum this is a way for us to attract companies like Eli Lilly and the leading emerging growth companies to meet in a private forum and you see we've had a lot of meetings and a lot of success in that area so let's get to scoring I'm going to talk a little bit about scoring and then I'm going to turn it over to Chris, uh, and he'll talk a little bit about Eli Lilly and search and evaluation activities at Lilly. And the scoring system, what we're trying to do, our primary goal with scoring is number the first on this list, uh, which is accredited investors. We're trying to help our accredited investors with due diligence uh, since this is not an angel group where people get together and there's forums. Even though you have the Q&A forum and we can facilitate one-on-one -on -one meetings with management, the scoring is a way for us to show our accredited investors what companies we think have, have the best chances of getting an approval, a partner, or an exit. And that's based on 2,000 companies, and we take a look at the algorithms of those companies, for example, the variables that correlate with success, and we normalize that data, and then what we do is we provide, we uh, stack the company against that, that uh, scoring, and then we stack rank the scorings and farm up from one being very best to 100 being least favorable but we don't show 26 and above we just show uh, we'll say 25 and above the first quartile can raise capital on the site uh, you also can be nominated by Eli Lilly for example they they full nominate you will we'll actually allow you to raise capital on the site as well so it helps the credit investors with due diligence investment professionals like VCs they may utilize it for a second set of eyes as, as well as strategic buyers on a, from a search and evaluation perspective, they'll also use it to supplement their internal efforts, not to replace, but just to supplement. And then all HX members have access to additional ways to do due diligence, whether it's forums, one-on-ones, roadshows, or our proprietary conferences that we just spoke about. The scoring system uh, essentially is 104 discrete quantifiable measures, thus the title of this presentation. It's statistically correlated to key success factors. There's a lot of algorithms. It's Google S. It really is pretty comp it's really comprehensive. By the way, we don't expect to get it right totally. There's no way anybody can do that. We're just trying to get the right companies in the top quartile. If you have a company that's 23rd and they should be third, we're not really that concerned about that. What we're really concerned about is the 26th company that that you know wanted to be in the portal or uh, uh, wanted to raise money in the portal and didn't get the opportunity. So that's what we're trying to uh, avoid. You have alerts upon changes. It's data-driven. Um, there's, you know, you look at some of the other points there, and that score is up in the right in northeast corner of these company pages, and that score changes from month to month. So uh, it's not a static score. So, for example, if you got a new patent, if you, ha if you filed an IND, 
If you hired a new manager from Amgen that's got 30 years of experience, if your competitor failed in the clinic, you know, if you got uh, fast track or breakthrough status, et cetera. So when any of those catalysts change the score, and when those scores change, uh, essentially you get an update as a follower of the page. The other thing is, is that high uh, companies, they call it data in motion, companies whose score changes rapidly will get profiled in our newsletters and other perks which we can talk about. So scoring is very important from a social media perspective, from a visibility perspective, and it's all, it's all user-generated data, meaning that uh, like LinkedIn, user-generated data from the companies, which is their catalyst, um, LinkedIn has proven that uh, user-generated data is some of the most accurate data in the world uh, due to the social media, media um, you know, components of visibility. This last slide on scoring, and then I'm going to hand it over to Chris. Uh, HX scoring, what we're trying to do with scoring is not only assist our accredited investors and VCs, we're also trying to assist Eli Lilly with identifying early stage companies. So, you know, here you're seeing, you're seeing that we're trying to provide the strategics with the best information uh, in the industry, and they also can customize their own scoring. And it's a proprietary tool allowing strategics to measure, monitor, and evaluate performance of companies and portfolios. And by maximizing transparency, the scoring will attract new capital and partnering activity from strategics. So for companies that want Eli Lilly's attention, a high score or a highly uh, trending score will be very advantageous. And you'll see companies are identified via 46 market sectors. So having said that, uh, I'd like to introduce Chris Vallejos, who is a manager of global external R&D at Eli Lilly. Good afternoon. Thanks to Scott for uh, inviting me to participate. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, discuss with you um, Lilly's approach to search and evaluation. Our global external R&D function uh, includes uh, components of search and evaluation across all therapeutic areas and geographies as well as due diligence and uh, also our chorus um, uh, development engine, which is a lean to proof of concept uh, drug development uh, engine. And so uh, again, as, as Scott indicated, um, you know, the pharma is, is uh, very active uh, in partnering, uh, but we're also very selective. And, and so what I wanted to do today was to walk you through uh, some of the aspects um, of what we look for in uh, potential um, uh, partnering candidates. By partnering, it could be in-license, it could be acquisition, it could be collaboration. Uh, it could also be uh, on the funding side. And uh, the reason is that the, the industry um, is rapidly uh, shifting. There are a number of challenges um, that have been faced. Um, uh, universities and research institutes are moving into the space of drug discovery and drug development. Um, and as a result, competing pharma companies are spending uh, large amounts of money to lock up top universities uh, in an effort to identify uh, very early uh, potential candidates and, and movers. Um, although there has been an increase in IPOs recently, in general, the reduction in the capital market uh, for healthcare funding. Um, has uh, uh, both uh, uh, driven uh, the scarcity and the price of true innovation, uh, and there's fierce competition, uh, especially for high-value disease mechanisms. And so, as, as kind of we look at the way research and development um, is uh, um, organized in, in a simplified version, um, Lilly could be the source of big ideas. Um, however, um, to really uh, uh, maximize the potential, we would want to tap the world's knowledge and experiment, uh, experience. We could also be the source of capacity and capabilities, but there are practical limits in terms of resources and, and, uh, uh, and prioritization. And then again, we could be the source of risk capital, uh, but again, you know, realities are that we possibly can't bear all of the risk and, and don't have the, the necessary resources to do so. So as a result, we've tried to get creative in the way we approach R&D to share risk and also to um, maximize our, uh, our lens in terms of uh, uh, available possibilities. 
And so if you consider um, from a, um, the way we view innovation, there, there's three major uh, lenses that, that we look through, so to speak. Discovery Research, our Lilly Research Laboratories, is interested in identification and validation of new targets, uh, access to new technologies, uh, research collaborations, uh, either uh, scientist to scientist or, or more broadly based collaborations, say, across uh, um, uh, university platforms, uh, needs in chemistry, and biomarkers. We also have a, a business unit uh, uh, construct at Lilly that is involved in uh, later stage development and commercialization of uh, drugs, and they're interested in clinical assets. Uh, they're interested in filling portfolio gaps, and they're also interested in identifying new areas in an opportunistic way that, uh, again, would bring in, you know, uh, clinical uh, primarily assets as well. And then finally, we have new growth engines, uh, looking at new indications, uh, repositioning current pipeline assets, or potentially new treatment paradigms. Um, and, and the intersection of these are really uh, pharma-ready proof of concepts uh, that uh, you know we could uh, make uh, go no go decisions on, um, and so you know our, our Lily's not the only kernel sourcing strategies. You know, some companies are um, uh, trying to engage early to co-develop an asset, for example, to help shape the asset to match the need, uh, um, and rather than waiting for the right product. Um, this would provide access to potentially quality target opportunities that may not otherwise be explored, uh, allowing for more shots on goal uh, with less cost, and a partnership via collaboration. This way it increases the chance of success because both Lilly and our partners are uh, equally invested and uh, working side by side. So again, um, one can maximize uh, each other's expertise on, uh, in, in the partnership. Uh, what we've found, however, is that the capturing value through later stage in licensing is becoming increasingly difficult, um, it, both in terms of the uh, ability of pharma and biotech to create molecules. And so the companies that have a uh, superior discovery capabilities or a privileged access to sources of new molecules will be in a dominant competitive position. Uh, and therefore, the opportunity to secure access um, may be more competitive um, early in the R&D cycle. And so unique R&D insights can be, uh, uh, be an advantage here. That's one of the things that really attracts us to the, the Healthios uh, portal is that uh, it allows us to um, have access to newly emerging companies uh, and, and really get in at, at the ground floor. And quite honestly, it's an area that um, you know, through our search and evaluate capabilities, we've not had uh, as much uh, um, uh, chances to um, uh, participate that early on. And so, you know, when we when we view external R and D, we view it as a complement to our internal R and D efforts uh, because we can balance both the technical and the financial uh, risk. Um, we can strengthen core disease areas because of the complement of our internal R and D with new targets or platforms. Um, and therefore, um, you know, we feel it would have the best opportunities for in license. We can establish relationships uh, with early stage innovators, which would extend our footprint and, and potentially um, allow us to uh, play in spaces of new pathways or new targets uh, that can be uh, de-risked externally. Um, new growth engines uh, in uh, new to Lilly diseases or treatment paradigms. And then finally, um, a model that we've uh, rolled out in the last uh, uh, year or so is to leverage alternative funding partnerships, uh, targeting geographies, uh, targeting um, uh, external, uh, external sources of capital uh, that allow us to find good companies or ideas uh, and uh, allow them to develop in partnership um, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and bring in molecules. And we see this as important because there's many challenges um, in terms of uh, productivity. So if you, if you think of the uh, research going you know, left to right from target to hit to uh, launch of a molecule as, as a funnel, 
uh, each uh, sector of this funnel um, becomes smaller because the uh, probability of success from stage to stage as we go from target to hit to lead to clinical candidate and, and then through the various phases of development, um, the, the probability of success um, becomes uh, 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 look at the, the mathematical equation, um, our productivity, which is the P, it, it's a function of, of the work we have in progress and it needs to be appropriately managed. I mean, again, we like our uh, competitors have a finite resource and a finite capacity to take on uh, work and to optimally prosecute that work. Uh, we also want to increase the probability of technical success. So as we go from hit to lead to clinical candidate, et cetera, uh, where there is, uh, especially at the earlier stages, a tremendous drop-off, we want to maximize or increase that probability so that we could, uh, the, the things that we decide to work on and resource are things that, uh, that we would be successful in. Um, we also want to increase the, the value of the pipeline and so that the total cost per, per launch is optimized. At the same time, we want to decrease the cycle time. So to get from target to, to launch the product, we want to decrease that time. Uh, and we also want to reduce the cost per clinical candidate. And so all of these factor into what we consider our, our, our productivity. And so if you look at the value chain uh, in, in more detail, when we consider a target uh, to drug candidate, the, the basic question we're trying to ask is, can I invent a molecule which modulates a model biological system? You know, specifically, is this target linked to a disease? Can I invent a molecule that could be a drug against this target? And does this drug potentially reduce efficacy in a relevant model system? As we start to take the candidate and develop human proof of concept, the key question there is, does the molecule produce the desired effect in human clinical trials? Is it safe? Does it hit the target? Can we measure some type of response when we modulate that target? And is it effective in patients? And then finally, in the late stage development, as we take it from proof of concept to launch, uh, does the molecule have uh, the property such uh, to be a commercial success? Is it approvable? Is it better than the standard of care? Uh, which patients will benefit and will payers want to pay for the innovation. And so these are all the factors that, that we consider. Uh, even as we're looking at earlier stage opportunities, we start to think about um, can we design the appropriate experiments to demonstrate proof of concept in human trials and will this be commercially successful? How does it compare to standard of care not only today, but uh, what's in a pipeline that would be um, present uh, when this molecule would uh, uh, at some point uh, make it into not only the clinic but also into uh, commercialization. And so, um, you know, our, our perspectives on value drivers for, for partnering are such that, you know, there's a great deal of scientific insight, investment experience, uh, leadership uh, across the different sectors, academic, finance, and, and biotech. Um, and, and people, quite honestly, are very um, uh, proud of the accomplishments that they have in taking Molecule to a certain place. Um, I, to be honest, our companies performed a lot of due diligence on a large number of assets that are uh, purported by the owner to have attained a key uh, value inflection point. And not every um, molecule that we look at under diligence uh, path, uh, passes our, our scrutiny. Um, the, the four fatal flaws we often see include uh, material quality from the CMNC perspective, Uh, clinical data quality, whether it's uh, experimental design, uh, the use of a, a clinical comparator, uh, the statistical analysis or the interpretation thereof, uh, the reimbursement thesis. In other words, how does this differentiate from what's already available or being developed? And then also um, uh, intellectual property. Uh, is there exclusivity and can that IP be defended? Uh, and so that the strong execution on these four drivers um, will help uh, to uh, get uh, molecules through our due diligence system. Again, from the, the 104 levels of success that uh, Healthios has, 
um, especially on the early stage companies in which you know there's there's very little data uh, either on the clinical side or on the on the uh, preclinical side. Uh, the we we see this scoring system as a um, you know not necessarily a um, a final criterion for investment, but certainly a a point that which we can triangulate on uh, to point us to companies that could potentially have a um, high level of interest for us um, that we would validate through our own due diligence process as well. As one looks at the um, tipping point in, in a partnership, in the past um, we felt that you know, if the compound had appropriate um, drug-like properties, good intellectual um, uh, uh, position, um, and, uh, and proof of concept, um, you know, depending on, of course, the FDA and, and the uh, OUS agencies, and, and clinical data, that was enough to uh, consider for partnering decision. But currently, there are a lot of other uh, parameters that, that um, uh, also impact these decisions. Uh, for example, um, the uh, generic landscape, the, the biosimilar uh, legislation and or landscape, the, the new FDA that's focused um, primarily on safety as a, a, a key driver, uh, the influence that payers and policymakers have, uh, differentiation, and, and a number of other of these parameters. Um, it, it has really um, caused a shift in terms of the, the considerations for um, our uh, partnering um, uh, uh, evaluation. And so you know, what we try to do in, in our group, uh, Global External R&D, is you know, we're, we're looking at a number, you know, up to hundreds of opportunities across the globe and across various therapeutic areas, and we're trying to um, estimate um, based on the probability of success uh, when a product will launch as well as how commercially attractive a given uh, product might be you know, based on uh, clinical data, strategic fit, um, a uh, IP position, uh, a competition, etc. So we're, we're trying to look at those companies, those opportunities that will have uh, the best chance of being successful Successful and also fitting within our, our strategy. And so, you know, the, the companies that do have a very high um, uh, uh, forecast of being attractive and, and that we think fits in, in a, you know, with a appropriate launch timing and a, and a high probability of being successful, you know, we'll take through our diligence process and, and ultimately through uh, uh, terms discussions. And those comp there's a number of companies that we identify that are probably not quite ready yet, but we think because of the innovation or the fit, um, when there's a key inflection point, you know, we'll continue to monitor the companies and quite honestly, there's a number that we also, um, you know, that for one reason or another, uh, based on the previous slides, uh, we don't see as very attractive and, and we try to decline early so we can focus on those uh, that we feel would be, um, uh, that have the highest uh, uh, value uh, for us. And so, just want to say a little bit more about our uh, due diligence process because it, it really does bring value to the, our partners uh, and potential partners as well as their investors. And so, you know, through the, the, the Lilly values of respect for people, integrity, and thirst for excellence, you know, we've set up a uh, process that, that really fits there. And so, you know, when we conduct a due diligence, there will be in-depth exposure to Lilly functional area experts. They, they comprise the due diligence team. It builds our uh, understanding of the partner's asset and technical capabilities and how that drives our alignment uh, and uh, commitment. Uh, it provides an independent assessment, um, which again uh, is very uh, valued by our partner companies. Uh, and also it gives the pr prospective partner uh, very transparent insights into our culture, our approach to decision making, and, and how this molecule will uh, fit uh, in the long run. Um, you know, again, you know, I, I touched on it earlier, there are a number of gaps and showstoppers that we find during the formal due diligence, whether it's uh, based on uh, drug-drug interactions or safety margin. Um, uh, the uh, lack of a regulatory staff at the partner company who is you know, not familiar with uh, 
uh, current standards, uh, poor CMNC, um, lack of a relevant comparator in a randomized trial, so we don't really get a good handle on you know how this uh, how the potential opportunity would uh, fit in a real world uh, setting, um, uh, inappropriately managed outsourcing work or uh, standard operating procedures that are not developed or followed or documented, and so you know failure uh, by uh, potential partners to plan and execute with these end products in mind. So again. You know, it, it's important to us that you know uh, things be um, appropriately managed from the very beginning, uh, because it really helps to, um, in terms of evaluation for our due diligence process. Um, one other gap that we see that's very um, uh, much a showstopper in former diligence is is the quality of uh, intellectual property. That there's a valid exclusivity. The patent life is enforceable, uh, you know, whether there's orphan drug classification. We see this quite a bit with uh, academic spin-outs because there's kind of the clash of cultures of um, publish uh, or perish. We see it as publish and perish from a commercial perspective. You know, academics are, are you know, driven towards the, the key publication to maintain uh, grant funding. However, a lot of times these publications represent a prior art that makes the IP fatally obvious and, and uh, you know, doesn't allow for that protection. And you know, we also see, you know, we, we value composition of matter. We see a lot of opportunities that have method of use or formulation IP, which um, you know, many times can be very important, but you know, the valuable patent is on the, on the composition side. Um, we want to make sure that the chemistry is correct in the patent's best, best mode section, um, that the patent council um, is comfortable with the scientist notebooks, um, and uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, companies you know, that are uh, used by uh, generic pharmaceutical companies, for example, um, you know, are, are experts in, uh, in the IP. So basically, if we want to invest behind a strong uh, exclusivity thesis, um, you know, it will be attacked, uh, and it's important to know how, how this is uh, going to come. And so, just in, in my last couple slides, um, our internal uh, strategy um, is kind of a find it, fund it, and development strategy. And our find it is coming through a number of different sources, uh, collaborations with universities, investment um, uh, banks, and, and uh, uh, biotech and pharma collaborations, public-private partnerships, uh, venture capitalists, uh, and uh, an open innovation portal that, that we've established as well. And so our group, in conjunction with the research laboratories and, and the business units, are trying to find the right opportunities. We'll fund it either through internal sources or through capital funds, and ultimately develop it, whether it's through our own um, uh, center of excellence um, and, and internal resources or through uh, our chorus, uh, lean to POC or other development platforms uh, that are set up in place to uh, essentially mirror the uh, internal portfolio uh, and develop external um, uh, opportunities. And we see these, this being a combination that allows us to contribute to a uh, strong pipeline and a sustainability in our R&D. So what we want to do is try to complement our strong integrated R&D capabilities um, and uh, uh, with uh, appropriate external opportunities and allows us to become a leader in developing new and innovative patient uh, medicines for patients. And so we have in the last uh, few years set up a number of uh, novel external innovation pathways. Um, we uh, are talking uh, and have uh, set up alliances with uh, uh, mid to late stage uh, direct partnerships with uh, biotech companies and, and even with uh, large pharma. Um, we've also created unique funding partnerships uh, through, for example, um, uh, either uh, uh, groups that have uh, you know, access to capital or through uh, foundations. We've set up a number of collaborations and partnerships through universities, both on a peer-to-peer -peer basis with our scientists as well as on a larger scale. Um, our open innovation uh, drug discovery and drug development portals have allowed us to identify molecules very early on 
and access to alternative funds and, and our course development engine. And then we have direct uh, collaborations within the industry, public-private partnerships, and strategic alliances. And so we've been, you know, the, the one-size-fits-all uh, no longer applies in, in our business. And again, we see it as very important uh, uh, to allow us to um, move forward and, and uh, develop new molecules. Uh, my last slide, alliances are key to our future. Um, it helps diversify our research targets, uh, enhance and balance our portfolio, um, allows us to share across the different aspects of the value chain uh, while capitalizing on the expertise and experience of a partner and to maximize uh, our global presence and, and uh, return on investment. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Uh, what we'll do, uh, what we'll do now, guys, is we will uh, have a short Q and A session. Um, so, uh, if you you have any questions, uh, we've had a couple come through during the presentation. The first one is: uh, Is Lily interested in cancer vaccine approaches, Chris? Yeah. So, vaccines are not a um, uh, have not been a uh, uh, high uh, priority effort within our. Um, whether it's oncology or in other um, uh, therapeutic areas for us. Okay. okay. So uh, let's talk a little bit about, um, it, there's a question that's come through that said, are you guys, will you be open to utilizing ITCH scoring in your search and evaluation efforts? And if so, would it be customized scoring? Would it be, um, you know, would we, you rely on Healthy Oils Exchange, for example, a crowdfunding portal to do it? And and if so, um, would that make it? Would that support your efforts? Would that influence your decision making? I think um, we're we're certainly open to working with Healthy Oils Exchange in terms of optimizing the scoring portal. Um, it, it's relatively new, and and Scott, as you indicated, it's also kind of a um, work in progress as as things go forward. We certainly see it as an important data point. Um, and uh, and also see the importance of working uh, with Healthios Exchange in terms of um, you know potentially customizing it uh, as as you know as we get more data and evaluate it. Okay, so here's uh, here's a question which is for me. Could you explain more about the HX scoring? So um, you know back in those slides where we uh, we were looking at um, essentially the scoring. And by the way, the scoring is not going to be launched until the first quarter of next year. But the scoring. Is an el el is algorithms quantitative algorithms to assess the prospects of a company being successful, so our investors can make the wisest investment decisions. And those 104 um, those 104 uh, quantitative measures are, have been validated by historical outcomes. Now, we all know that history doesn't play out into the future. Um, you know perfectly, but we I think we all could agree that there's things in scoring that you know you can really assess, which is you know patents, management team, partnerships, size of the market, stage of development, regulatory pathway, the molecular target itself, how hot it is, um, you know competitive landscape, that sort of thing. So uh, I'd be more than happy, by the way, to talk with any of you, uh, you know, in more detail um, on scoring um, at your convenience. So it's um, let me uh, put it on. By the way, if uh, you'd like to contact me, here's my contact information, and I'll give you a second there. And then um, the next slide will be Chris Vallejos's contact information. I would highly encourage, uh, if you're an emerging growth company, et cetera, uh, interested in learning more about Eli Lilly and partnering with them, you know, please contact Chris as well. So as I hear a farmer talk about willingness to look at new, new disease targets, but the reality seems to be that the interests are still areas of internal focus. Is Lily different, and how does Lily play a part? Chris? We are um, constantly looking at new um, areas. Uh, we just completed a big strategic exercise uh, where we're trying to identify uh, potentially new, uh, new areas of uh, investment. Um, yes, there is some legacy. Uh, in terms of areas where we've got concentrated and, and, and demonstrated um, areas of success in the past, but we also realize uh, to go forward, uh, it's important that we, um, uh, you know, are open to investigating new areas and uh, 
uh, you know, we, we will consider those in terms of, uh, uh, you know, strategic uh, uh, fit. Chris, does Lily have an interest in refractory epilepsy? Um, I don't know, but I can refer that question offline to uh, my colleague who handles our neuroscience portfolio. I'm sorry, I'm just going to say that, uh, and I should have brought it up front, um, my uh, area of um, expertise and, and my responsibility is in uh, cardiovascular and internal medicine. Um, our global external R&D group has subject matter experts in oncology, in diabetes, uh, neuroscience, uh, autoimmune diseases, and so if there are areas that aren't uh, within my core, I can certainly find out from my colleagues. Okay, good. Any other questions out there? Um, we'll just wait another 30 seconds and then uh, we'll conclude. Like I said, everybody will get the presentation and the audio so you can uh, talk 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 at your convenience or you can review at your convenience. Uh, here's a question. It says, uh, you know, if I participated in the portal, if I became a member of the portal, um, would I be able to reach out to you directly via the portal? So uh, the, I'll answer that question. So right now the um, the strategics, we do not have the contact information for our strategics on the portal due to privacy. And um, however, uh, you can contact us to make a liaison between the strategics since we do have very strong relationships due to our partnering conferences with, like say, Chris. So um, in the future, we will be building out those pages. You will be able to follow actually strategics in the future to get updates on their pages. And um, you know, we think that that would be that would be a very uh, a strong amenity. Is Lily interested in surgical adhesions? <laughs> so, I guess from that perspective, um, you know, we you're a cardiovascular, right, Chris? So I guess that's another one that you would probably refer over. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we're um, in terms of devices. Um, we're we're currently not in the device space, at least on the on the CV side. Yeah. Okay, guys, I think that's it. I uh, just want to encourage all of you to curate your pages, uh, send your documents, um, you know, uh, to us so that we can curate your pages. The, the more your pages are curated, the more detail, the, the better it will help both your score. It will also help Chris and his team evaluate your company uh, and also friend each other as well. You can friend Chris Playhouse through the portal, and by doing so, you guys can have private discussion. Thanks again, guys. You feel free to get a hold of me at any time. My direct line again is 847-849-1736. Have a great, uh, have a great day and a great weekend. Yep. Great, and also thank you. I appreciate your uh, uh, sticking with us today. And uh, Scott, look forward to working with you. Thanks.